welcome everybody to uh, today's uh, IEEE GRSS uh, Distinguished Lecture uh, by uh, Dr. William Blackwell, who's uh, with uh, MIT Lincoln Laboratory. Uh, this is an event that's jointly organized by IEEE GRSS, uh, both Bangalore and Hyderabad sections, and um, IEEE Council and uh, IEEE uh, Computational Intelligence Society. So we are all very happy to have you here. And this is the first, uh, um, uh, it's actually the second year that both Hyderabad and Bangalore chapters are co-organizing. And we are very happy to have Dr. Uh, Bill here. Um, in, it's very early for him and still he made it. So we are very thankful. Um, so I'll just uh, give the uh, stage to Mausmi to uh, introduce the speaker. So before that, I'm Jaya. I'm the IEEE GRSS Bangalore section chair. And we have the slate here, so uh, we'll see each of them in, in due time. And uh, we are ha happy to have our audience. Uh, it's late in India, but still they are here. So that's the, it's uh, evening in on a Friday, and uh, we are uh, really grateful to have the audience here as well. So yeah, so without much ado, um, ask me, it's yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Jaya. And uh, I would like to welcome uh, Bill Blackwell for accepting today's invitation for the Joint Association DL program by Bangalore section and Hyderabad section. I would like to take the opportunity to introduce today's speaker. Bill Blackwell received the BEE degree in electrical engineering from Gorgia Institute of Technology, Atlanta in 1994 and SM and science degrees in electrical engineering and computer science from Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, USA in 1995 and 2002 respectively. Since 2002, he has been with the Lincoln Laboratory MIT, where he is currently an associate leader of the Applied Space Systems Group. He serves or has previously served on the NASA at Atmospheric Infrared Sounder and NPP science teams, the Joint Polar Satellite System Sounding Operational Algorithm Team, and the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Radio Frequencies. He was the Integrated Program Officer uh, Office Sensor Scientist for the Advanced Technology Microwave Sounder on the Xiaomi National Polar Partnership launched in 2011 and the Atmospheric <coughs> Algorithm Development Team Leader for the National Polar Orbiting Environmental Satellite System, System Microwave Imager uh, Sounder. He has served as the Principal Investigator on the mic Micromass 1, Micromass 2, and Mirata Microwave Sounding CubeSat missions and is currently the PI on the NASA Tropics Earth Venture mission. His current research interests, including atmospheric remote sensing, including the development and calibration of airborne and spaceborne microwave and infraspectral infrared sensors, retrieve of geophysical products from remote radiance measurements and the applications of electromagnetic signal processing and estimation theory. Dr. Blackwell was the recipient of the 2009 NOAA David Johnson Award for his research in the neural network retrievals and microwave uh, calibration and was selected as a 2012 recipient of the IEEE Region 1 Managerial Excellence in Engineering Organization Award for Outstanding Leadership of the Multidisciplinary Technical Teams Developing innovation, Innovative Future Microwave Remote Sensing System. We are very much glad to have you, sir, he here with us, and uh, we are eager to listen to your talk. Thank you so much. Please, the stage is yours. Thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And I, I apologize for keeping you late on a Friday evening. So I will get right into this. I, I'm gonna talk about, uh, this is a new NASA mission where we're flying a constellation of CubeSats. We call these three U CubeSats. Uh, a U is a 10 by 10 by 10 centimeter cube. 
So these satellites are three U, so they're approximately 30 centimeters long by 10 by 10. So they're very tiny, about five kilograms. We're gonna fly six of these over the tropical cyclone belt and low earth orbit. And each of these CubeSats has a scanning passive microwave uh, sounder that measures upwelling radiance from 90 to 205 gigahertz. And what this will do for us, it, it will provide better observations of tropical cyclones um, with much better revisit rate on the order of about an hour, median revisit. So we can capture the dynamics of the storm and see how they form and intensify and dissipate. And we'll try to improve our ability to forecast the track and intensity of the storm. So this is called the Tropics mission. So I'll give you an update on, on uh, Tropics. And we've built seven satellites. We've actually launched one of them called that the Pathfinder and the data looks really good. I'll show you some data from that satellite and give you uh, a look ahead to the constellation which we'll start launching in March of next year. Let me get started. To, let, me, let me motivate the problem a little bit. And we, we all know the tropical cyclones are very impactful uh, events. Uh, they have very large societal and economic impacts. Um, so there's tremendous motivation to try to do a better job of certainly forecasting where they're going to go and the, the intensity that they will have when they hit, make landfall so we can uh, do better with disaster management and so forth. This is just one example. This is Hurricane Dorian uh, from two years ago. Very strong storm causing loss of life, loss of property. Um, so there's certainly a lot of room for improvement in the forecasting of these very powerful storms. So not only are the storms very uh, powerful, they are a lot of them at any given time in the day. So this is again one example in September of 2019 where there are about a dozen of either a named tropical cyclone or a tropical uh, depression that's about to form into a more powerful named tropical storm. So it's a truly global phenomenon. So we need to architects and um, an observatory that's capable of measuring a single storm with very high resolution spatially and spectrally. And also we need to measure you know, the storms over the entire globe. So it's a very challenging observational problem from a, you know, from a satellite standpoint. So we need you know, a, a low earth orbiting constellation works very well for this because it solves both the problem of the, the high spatial resolution that you need and the persistence over the globe that you need. Okay, so there are a couple of fundamental measurements that we need to observe from, from the satellite uh, to say something useful about a tropical cyclone and how it might intensify. Uh, one is the humidity profile. Uh, so the warm, moist air around the storm is really the fuel that drives the storm and makes it intensify. So that warm, moist air gets drawn upward and starts to rotate the storm to form into a cyclone. So we need a, a humidity profile as a function of altitude. That's what the red curve there on the right of the screen is. We also need a temperature profile. Uh, so this is actually a cross-section through the eye of the storm. Uh, blue colors are cold, red colors are warm. And the interesting thing is that vertically aloft at about eight kilometers up in this eye of the storm, it, there's a warming called the warm core anomaly. And that warm core anomaly is strongly correlated to the intensity of the storm. So we can measure that by looking down the eye of the, of the, of the tropical cyclone with a temperature sounding radiometer and deriving that warm core anomaly and relating that to intensity. So that's the second thing we need to measure, temperature profile. And then the third thing is the precipitation. So here's an animation that I hope is coming through uh, that shows the, the spiral rain bands and very intense scattering uh, near the eye of the storm that tells us how hard it is raining. Uh, so these are the, the key thermodynamic variables that we need to measure, temperature, humidity, precipitation, uh, in four dimensions. So three-dimensional space and one dimension in time. So we need very high spatial resolution and global persistence uh, to adequately represent uh, the state of the tropical cyclone. So there are a number of ways that you could imagine that we could make these measurements. Um, radars are very sensitive to precipitation, but we typically don't have uh, very many radars over open ocean where the tropical cyclones are, are active. Um, so those aren't particularly useful when we don't have them, when we need them. Uh, we can fly aircraft over and through the storms, but, but those tend to be spatially sparse. There's not very many of those. There are some new techniques for measuring wind speed uh, using GNSSRO, uh, the NASA Cygnus mission, as one example. 
Um, that gives you the idea of the, of the wind speed near the ocean surface, but it does not uh, inform anything about the thermodynamic uh, inside of the storm, the temperature, and the moisture. Uh, geostationary satellites um, provide a very nice way to stare down at the storm and take very high revisit measurements. However, we don't have microwave imagers on geostationary satellites, only visible and infrared. And the problem there is that those measurements are, are largely blocked by the cloud top. So you can't see what's going on underneath the clouds in the visible IR geostationary measurements. So passive microwave sounding is a nice compromise. It gets us all the, uh, the, the key observations that we need with useful resolution uh, spatially. And with a constellation, we can have high temporal resolution. So I'll be talking about a passive microwave sounding mission. Another way to assess the utility of all of the various measurements that go into uh, forecasting is to rank them in terms of how much they improve the forecast. So a, a bar that's farther to the right on this plot indicates that the measurement is, is helping the, the forecast the best. So at the very top of this, you'll see the microwave, humidity, precipitation, and temperature, the three variables that I just mentioned, turn out to be uh, the, the, the most important variables for, for forecasting. I uh, want a global scale, uh, better than the infrared, aircraft measurements, uh, scatterometry, GPSRO. Um, those are important, but not as important as the microwave. So further motivation to try to architect a global observatory using passive microwave measurements. They provide very useful data. Now, the way that we generate a profile that is we're measuring a temperature or moisture as a function of altitude is we make use of very specific absorption lines in the atmosphere. Uh, for example, on this slide, I'm showing you an oxygen absorption line that is at 118.75 gigahertz. So there's very strong absorption near that line center. So if I have an instrument in space looking down at the Earth, observing near the line center at 118.75 gigahertz, I only see the very top of the atmosphere. And as I move away in frequency, from the line center, I can see progressively deeper into the atmosphere. And if I'm up far off the line, say 114, 113 gigahertz, I can see all the way to the surface. So I can use this effect to build up a vertical profile. If I, if I pick a channel shown in the very dark shading there, that's off the line center, I, I can sense the lower portion of the atmosphere. And by moving in frequency closer to the line center where there's more absorption, I can walk upwards in altitude and measure higher portions of the, of the atmosphere with frequencies that are closer to the line. So the tropics radiometer has seven channels near this line that we use to measure temperature as a function of altitude. And water vapor works very similarly. There's another line at 183.31 gigahertz that we use for water vapor. So we've been flying satellites with microwave radiometers for decades now. Uh, that's not a new idea. And here's one example of one of the weather satellites that we fly in the US um, with, uh, through, through NOAA. And they're very big satellites. They're very capable. They're very expensive. Here for scale, if you can see my cursor, here's, here's a person kind of leaning over the bench. But it's a very big satellite. There's the, the instrument here with the red cover. There's the advanced technology microwave sounder that makes the microwave measurements. But these satellites are, are so big and expensive and, and take so long to build and launch and test that we don't have very many of these. Uh, they're, they're on the order of maybe two or three of these, uh, a, a few more that are, that are working to some degree, but we don't have as many as we'd like. And the regret is that we only have about a four hour revisit rate with the current systems. And that's insufficient to resolve the dynamics of something like a tropical cyclone that's changing on the, on the time scale of minutes. So a new approach is to essentially try to make the microwave sensor smaller and more affordable so we can fly a lot more of them in a constellation. Um, so I'll, sh I'll talk about some technology um, evolution of the radiometer, make them smaller so we can fly them in a constellation. And if we can fly a lot of them, now we can drive the revisit rate down to the order of you know, half an hour or even more. So the technology to, to make that happen has evolved over the last 10 years or so. And here's a timeline of, of the key things that have made that possible. The shrinking of that, that ATMS, which is about 100 kilograms, down to the payload that we fly on tropics, which is about one kilogram. So it's about a factor of 100 reduction in the mass. 
So we started working with some of our university partners at the University of Massachusetts and MIT on building the receivers that we would need for this. We need very small, low power, sensitive, stable receivers um, to, to measure the, the incoming radiance uh, and provide a measure of power over those bands that I showed you in those gray and, and, and black columns on the temperature profile plot. So we, we developed that technology and we started to design a very small CubeSat. This, the Beaverworks 3 was a project with MIT Aero Astro Department to try to figure out how to accommodate a spinning microwave payload on the end of a 3U CubeSat. And then we launched Micromass 1 in 2015 uh, that, that proved a lot of the core technologies that we needed to make this happen. And then we evolved further into a CubeSat that's called Murata that was funded by NASA that had multiple bands. On that satellite, we flew uh, a 50 to 60 gigahertz radiometer and a water vapor radiometer, uh, but it did not scan. And then finally, to put all the pieces together in January of 2018, we launched the Micromass 2A, which had a scanning multiband radiometer and that worked, worked very well. So you can see kind of what, what happened over the last 10 years. We worked on the receiver components, satellite components, uh, added in the, the spinning radiometer, multiple bands to do temperature, moisture, and precipitation. And then finally, the, the, the proof of concept demonstration for all of those pieces. And that culminated in this mission, Micromass 2A in, in 2018, as I mentioned. And here's some data. So on the left is the Micromass 2A with a satellite shown here. This is again about five kilograms. And over here, the, the SWIMI NPP uh, big NOAA satellite. And the data are very comparable. This is a channel near 90 gigahertz. This is a, a window channel. And this is the, the northern coast of Alaska. We can see some very cold uh, ice on the top of a mountain and some warmer um, snow over the, over the ocean here to the north. So it compares very favorably to, to the ATMS, a much larger, more expensive instrument. So this demonstration uh, really proved that we can make very good measurements from a small, affordable CubeSat platform. So having this capability, uh, the next thing was to try to scale this up into a constellation. And there have been other people uh, that have been uh, working on microwave radiometers. These are some NASA funded projects that you might be aware of. Uh, Ice Cube was a, a sub-millimeter wave imager operating near 883 gigahertz for, for cloud ice detection. Uh, that was not a scanning system. Uh, Tempest D it had five channels for water vapor profiling that launched in 2018 after Micromass 2A. Uh, that worked very nicely, but didn't have temperature sounding channels. And then Rain Cube is, was the first radar that was operated from a CubeSat platform. So that was a big step forward to show that we not only could we make passive microwave, but also active microwave measurements from a very small CubeSat platform. So given all of these capabilities and the evolution of, of the, uh, the technology needed to make very high fidelity measurements from CubeSats, we can now talk about constellations to make these measurements. And Tropics is, is one such example. This is really the, the focus of the talk here is the NASA Tropics mission. So this is part of what NASA calls their Earth Venture Program. Uh, so I lead this mission at MIT. I have a lot of really great partners at NASA and NOAA and universities, Wisconsin, uh, Miami, uh, Tufts, MIT campus. And what we're trying to do here is show that we can use a constellation of six of these CubeSats with 12 channels spanning 90 to 205 gigahertz to make those measurements that I talked about, the temperature, the moisture, precipitation uh, on very fast time scales um, to make better predictions of, of tropical cyclones. So we're partnering with, with uh, many companies to make this possible. Blue Canyon Technologies is building the CubeSat bus and actually operating the spacecraft on orbit. I mentioned that we launched uh, what we call the Pathfinder. We, we built a qualification unit before we built the six flight units to check out the design. And we decided to launch that in advance of the mission to check out all the mission elements. And that launched on, on June 30th of this year. That's working very well. I'll show you some data. And a company called Astra was selected by NASA to launch the Constellation starting in March of next year. So we're very excited that the Constellation will soon be up. So I'll give you some details on the mission and the satellites that will, uh, that will comprise the Constellation. So again, a very small 3U CubeSat, 36 centimeters in length, 5.4 kilograms. Uh, and there's a lot of technology packed into this small uh, envelope. There are two star trackers, 
There are two S-band antenna for full duplex radio. There's all the avionics and the power. This is an articulating solar array that, that rotates to track the sun as the satellite orbits. Here's the payload uh, on the end that, that rotates at 30 RPM with the 12 channels that uh, measure between 90 and 205 gigahertz. Uh, one interesting aspect of the TRAPEX mission is the orbits. So we have selected three orbital planes. So there will be two satellites in each of those three orbital planes, and they're inclined at 30 degrees, which you can, I hope you can see this animation. And the altitude is 550 kilometers. And what that does is it creates a sweet spot of the width of the swath and the spatial resolution of the observations and also the revisit rate. So those things are optimized with this configuration. We don't need to, to view the poles because there are no tropical cyclones at the poles. Um, so that's why we cut off at about 40 degree latitude. All right here are some details on the insides of the CubeSat. Um, so we have things like GPS, the GPS antenna, the motor that turns the solar array. Uh, here's a one view of the star tracker. There's another star tracker on the other side of the spacecraft the two S-band antennas, some interface electronics, a very thin motor that turns the payload at 30 RPM. There's a hole in the middle of this with a slip ring that passes the data from the payload back to the bus for downlinking to the ground. And then the payload is here at the end of this uh, spacecraft. Okay, in terms of the, uh, the launch and the ground segment, Here's a very quick overview of how that will work. So I mentioned Astra is the company that will launch us um, starting next year. We expect the launches to happen in March. There'll be three launches, one launch for each of those three orbital planes. Uh, those will happen early next year, hopefully before uh, you know, late springs so will be up and commissioned in time for the Atlantic hurricane season in 2022. Our requirement on revisit rate is 60 minutes. Uh, so that's the median the amount of time that the, the next satellite will fly over and make a new measurement. And we expect to do a little bit better than 60 minutes. We'll probably hit a 40 to 50 minute revisit rate for our baseline performance. In the middle picture, you can see the orbital tracks for the, uh, the, the three planes and the two satellites in each of the three planes. We have ground stations in South Africa, Dubai, Singapore. We'll downlink the data multiple times per day. Uh, KSAT Light is the company that will be handling our, our ground station downlinks. Uh, Blue Canyon, I mentioned, is going to be the, the, uh, the mission operator. Uh, data will be downlinked to uh, MIT and to the University of Wisconsin for processing. And then the general public will have access to the data through the, uh, the NASA Goddard uh, Just Disk Data Archive system. So all the data will be made available to the public. So a little more information on why we chose those orbits with 30 degree inclination and 550 kilometer altitude. So here is a historical uh, plot of all the, the named tropical cyclones. You can see uh, a couple of things happening. There's nothing near the equator and there's nothing poleward of about you know, 45 degrees north and south. So knowing that, that, that almost all tropical cyclones uh, up here between these bands, plus minus 40, and nothing near the equator, we can optimize the orbital configuration where we put the satellites so that our maximum sensitivity in terms of revisit rate is aligned with these two peaks of where the storms are likely to form. And that's what we do. That's, that's really what, what uh, the, the calculus that was used to pick these, you know, six satellites and three planes with 30 degree incline, incline orbits because we can get the peak of the revisit time, the best revisit time to match up with the peaks of the storm frequency. And that's what gives us the median revisit rate of about 40 to 50 minutes with only six satellites. Okay, a few more details on the, uh, the CubeSat platform. So the spacecraft draws about 15 watts on average, so relatively low power. Uh, the array gives us uh, 30 watts when it's in the sun. We're in the sun for a, about half the time and then we're in eclipse for half the time. So there are batteries on board that we charge up when we're in the sun to run the payload uh, when we're in eclipse. Uh, the, the, the antenna size here, this aperture is 83 millimeters, uh, which gives us the spatial resolution I'll talk about shortly, uh, 25 kilometers for temperature and roughly 16 kilometers for, for water vapor. Uh, here are some information on the channels. So remember back to this, the, the plot that I showed you of the oxygen absorption line. 
at 118.75. So we have a channel that's very close to that line and then some channels that are off the line. And we have channels near the 183.31 water vapor line. And our, our highest frequency channel is 204, 205 gigahertz, which is very sensitive to uh, scattering of ice particles. I'll show you some nice imagery that we've collected with that channel. And then the bus again has all kinds of, of components that we need to operate on orbit, the reaction wheels to counteract the momentum of the spinning payload, uh, the avionics, um, all the things that uh, you know, determine where, where we are pointed, make sure we are pointing at the earth and have very good geolocation, those kinds of things. And all this folds up and goes into a CubeSat dispenser uh, prior to launch. So here's an animation that shows uh, the, the, the bus is, is as we're flying along, the payload is spinning. I'm not showing the payload here, I'm keeping that fixed. Uh, but the bus is rotating and the solar array is turning. So this keeps the sun on the array all the time. And it also points our, our antennas to the ground stations when we, uh, uh, we need to downlink our data. And this doesn't disrupt the payload. The payload is spinning independent of those operations. So we, we have data collection all the time, 100% duty cycle while that is going on. So here is a picture that shows uh, all the absorption lines in the spectrum up to 500 gigahertz. So again, we have temperature bands near this oxygen line. We have water vapor bands here near the water vapor line. And then we have imaging bands at 205 and 90 gigahertz that bracket either side of those two absorption lines. So those are 12 channels that we use on tropics. Uh, more details on the spectral characteristics of the channels for those of you who are interested in this kind of thing. The bandwidths range from about 300 megahertz to a gigahertz for the temperature sounding and very wide bandwidths for the water vapor uh, band. Since that line is, is, is pretty broad, that, we, that works just fine to give us about three kilometer vertical resolution for, for water vapor. And here is the spatial resolution, 24.1 kilometers at nadir for temperature, uh, 17 kilometers at nadir for water vapor and 15 kilometers for that 205 gigahertz uh, cloud ice channel. Very good sensitivities. And you'll see that when I show you the imagery here in a minute. So we have five main products that we generate from tropics. I think I've mentioned most of these. So the temperature and the moisture profile, just to give you a sense of, of what our requirements are. Uh, and our projections show that we should be able to meet our requirements um, fairly easily. There's a, a precipitation, a rain rate uh, product that we're going to generate, and then two products that are associated with intensity that we measure from the, the warm core anomaly and then the eye, minimum sea level pressure and maximum sustained wind. Um, and we're doing very well on all five products based on simulations. And I should also mention that when we launch, we'll have at least a, a one year science collection period. We hope we will last longer than that, but our baseline requirement is one year for operations. Here's some more details on how we calibrate the system, which is a little unique uh, relative to other passive microwave systems that have flown before us. So we scan across the earth. Uh, there's a plus or minus 60 degree sector that we use to measure the earth. And then we scan away from the earth and do calibrations, measuring the deep sky. And we turn on a noise diode against the cold sky uh, to give us the calibration for the hot, hot calibration point with the noise diode and the cold calibration point uh, as the second. So we can draw a line between those two and calibrate our data. We need to pay attention to where the sun and the moon are in the rotating field of view to keep those out to make sure those don't corrupt the calibration. Uh, but this works quite nicely and it allows us to calibrate without um, a very large internal calibration targets, which is, a, which is an advantage. Okay, let's see here. Here we go. So here's some details on the payload. I showed you the inside of the bus. Here is the inside of the payload. So we try to make the antenna assembly uh, as large as we can to optimize our spatial resolution. And we fit the electronics around the inside of the cube outside that antenna. So you see our, our water vapor radiometer here is very small. The temperature radiometer and the channelizer are on the left back portions of the cube. Control electronics, the, uh, the very thin scanning motor and the slip ring through the middle of that, and then all the structure to tie all this together. So very tight integration of all these parts uh, to make this very small. Here are some pictures of the components. Here's the antenna system. 
uh, with two feed horns. These are the essentially the, the, the 90 to 120 gigahertz and the 180 to 205 gigahertz. Both illuminate the back surface with this parabolic reflector through the wire grid polarizer. Uh, very high performance, very good beam quality. Uh, here's the temperature radiometer that University of Massachusetts uh, made for us. Here's the water vapor radiometer on the lower right, the pancake motor, control electronics, and the custom board for the channelization um, of the temperature band. Uh, we're very grateful to NASA Earth Science Technology Office for some funding to, to push a lot of this work forward prior to tropics. So here's the assembled uh, payload. Uh, you can see you know, how tightly packed these things are. This is the G-band receiver, 183 temperature receiver and the feed assembly over here in the corner. Here's a nice shot of the wire grid uh, polarizing dichroic for the beam combining. And the scanning motor there's at the bottom. So we do a lot of pre-launch calibration testing uh, prior to launch to make sure that the system is working well. Um, so the way we do that is we put the payload in the middle of this uh, apparatus with three calibration, very large black body targets, uh, one on either side and one on the bottom. We put this in the TVAC uh, calibration chamber, pump that down to simulate the environments of space, and then we operate the payload while we change the temperature of the payload and also the temperature of the calibration targets uh, to recreate what we'll see as we're flying in space. And we look at uh, the, the sensitivity and the stability and our accuracy uh, with concentrating, especially on the noise diodes to make sure that they're stable and, and working well. So we did, did this on all the vehicles prior to launch. And just to give you a sense of what we're trying to do there, uh, this is one example. This is the noise diode output um, for two different cases. Uh, this is an, an F band, the 118 gigahertz in blue and the G band in red. And as we change the temperature of the payload, we're looking to see how the output of the diode responds because this is our calibration signal. And then we can calculate the absolute accuracy error that we make uh, for, the, uh, for the temperature radiometer and the water vapor radiometer. Uh, our requirements are in these red dashed lines and we're doing much better than the requirements uh, with the performance near zero error with two within the noise of the, of the system. So we use a TVAC chamber um, to, to confirm that we're making these very small errors on calibration before we fly. To compare our performance against ATMS, uh, I'm showing you, uh, these are the, the three water vapor channels, 9, 10, 11, that we fly on tropics that we also fly on ATMS. So the bars and the, with the pink outline here for these three channels give you the performance of the, the, uh, the two ATMS instruments that are on orbit now and the one that will fly in early next year, just to give you a sense of how our performance stacks up to the ATMS. And we, you see, we're very comparable. Some of our tropic satellites actually have better noise than ATMS. And we're, we're by and large comparable to the, you know, the state of the art in ATMS. Channel 12 uh, is not flown on ATMS. This is a new channel that only, only tropics is flying. And our noise performance is very good in this channel. And I'll show you some imagery um, coming up on that as well. So very good performance on the Tropics radiometer systems, even that very small, uh, low cost package. So as you can probably imagine, we've been doing all kinds of simulations uh, to, to develop our algorithms and tune them up and to try to validate them, um, getting ready for the, for the flight. Uh, here's some examples of the things that we use to do that. So there's something called the Hurricane Nature Run that we use to simulate what tropics we'll see. And uh, you see that in the lower right hand part of your screen. So we were able to run our algorithms through all this data and make sure that we are meeting our performance requirements and all the algorithms are working uh, prior to launch. Okay, so here's uh, pictures of the flight hardware. So here's the final, this is the Pathfinder qualification unit. It's now on orbit with the payload spinning and the array turning. Uh, and then here are the six flight units that will launch uh, next year. Okay, so good news. We've launched the first one. We launched the Pathfinder in June of this year on a SpaceX Falcon 9. Um, we got uh, radiometric first light uh, in August. I'll show you that picture. Uh, NOAA and NASA are funding us to try to, to improve the latency down to the ground so we can get the data to the ground very quickly. For the folks who are doing the real-time forecasting, they need the data quickly. So we're going to try to, to do the best, best we can to get the data down quickly. Uh, and NASA is funding extended mission operations of the Pathfinder satellite. And again, all the data for the Pathfinder will also be available to the general public. So let me show you some data that we collected with the Pathfinder here. So here's our first light image. This is just the, the, essentially the first image out of the radiometer. It looks fantastic. 
really good data. So you can see all kinds of fine scale structure in the water vapor uh, over the ocean in the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, very good image quality, very good geolocation around the coasts of Australia, for example. You see that we're working very well. Uh, so this is a, a 90 gigahertz channel that responds to water vapor over ocean and to surface effects. Here's a, a, a mid-atmospheric uh, temperature channel near 118 gigahertz. Again, you can see a lot of fine scale structure. You can see a lot of scattering from convective activity near the equator. Uh, the blues here are, are relatively strong scattering from ice and, and, the, and the storms that you see there. Again, very good image quality. And then finally, here's the new 205 gigahertz channel. So you see very strong deep blues from scattering off the convective ice in these storms. And uh, again, very good data quality over the globe. So we're very thrilled with, you know, kind of right out of the gate, we got very good image quality. Um, but this is a, a hurricane mission. So here are some images of Hurricane Ida we collected. Uh, again in August, and this is as the storm was was approaching uh, the Gulf Coast of the United States. Uh, here it's at maximum intensity. You can see very clearly the eye is resolved and the rain bands, the spiraling rain bands are resolved. And as it makes landfall uh, in Louisiana, in the US, uh, this organizational structure breaks down. There's a lot of water that comes out and, and the storm becomes very disorganized after it's made landfall. So these pictures were taken uh, 12 hours apart we have the constellation up, we'll get be able to fill in the gaps here and have images every 45 minutes or so. So we're very pleased with the quality of the data coming out of Pathfinder and look forward to constellation. So to kind of summarize here, this is you know a, a first of its kind constellation um, to, to push forward in a very meaningful way the, uh, the ability to capture with a very high revisit um, tropical cyclone data uh, with a microwave constellation. So the the CubeSat hardware, they've all been delivered. One is on orbit working great. Six are at the launch provider um, awaiting launch in early next year. Uh, I showed you we've been working very hard to get ready for the mission with simulated data and also doing exercises with the Pathfinder on orbit data. Uh, Pathfinder is up, working great and providing some data that we can use to exercise all aspects of the mission before Constellation launches next year. And that will start happening in early 2022. So just to conclude here, I think there's a lot of potential um, to use these new classes of, of smaller, affordable constellations to solve some very important, meaningful problems um, uh, you know, across the, the, the scientific landscape. Um, so with that, I'm, I'm happy to stop and, and answer any questions if you have any. Um, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, um, Bill. It's been a great talk. Um, so if anybody would like to ask questions, please feel free to raise your hand. I can unmute you. And you can also ask questions in the Q&A and also in chat. Uh, but me, like, yes, as a question trickle in. Um, so Bill, uh, I had a couple of questions related to, um, so you had mentioned that the CubeSats, uh, 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 the, the way it works is it's, it's more, uh, cost effective and time effective compared to the traditional satellites, right? But uh, right. there must be something that is still um, uh, adding to the cost of, uh, uh, the, uh, of building these satellites, right? So for instance, uh, can um, the newer technologies like 3D printing reduce um, the cost of uh, making these, uh, uh, these are nano satellites, right? So the more you make and deploy it, maybe we can gather more data, right? I mean, that's the, the, the direction the mission is taking, right? So is there any plan to make it even more cost effective? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's a great question. And there's, there are things like, you know, 3D printing um, that are enabling these kinds of missions, these new technologies uh, that, that make us you know, do things, you know, less expensively or more easily. Um, 3D printing is one example of that, and you know, a specific example of that is um, we're trying to expand these types of small satellites to include lower frequencies. So the lowest frequency on Tropics is 90, but we'd like to include 50 to 60, we'd like to include 31, 23.8, and what happens there is you need larger antennas to give you useful spatial resolution. So one way you get that is you can 3D print deployable structures, right? You can deploy these antennas and then get the lower frequency. So we're exploring those kinds of things, um, you know, to further evolve these systems to include more frequencies and better performance. So, so most definitely. 
Okay, so um, the other question I had is, I think uh, a lot of the interest in India would be for the monsoon modeling and related problems, right? I mean, I understand uh, CubeSat is developed for uh, the hurricane um, tracking, right? Do you see um, any future to it, um, looking at how uh, monsoon can be, uh, you know, tracked, modeled, um, predicted, etc.? cetera? Uh, would that be of interest to? Yes, absolutely. So I think we're, we're very interested in, in working with the international community on, you know, seeing how we can do better, of, you know, not just the, the hurricanes in the Atlantic basin, but over the entire globe. And I should mention that we do have a tropics, what we call the early adopter program. It's through NASA Marshall. Um, and Patrick Duran is, is running that. And if you want to email me, I can send you details. So if, if you have an interested investigator who wants to work with Tropics data for a specific problem, mm -hmm. uh, we can get you coupled into the mission very tightly through the Early Adopters Program. Right. Uh, so I did take a look at the data viewers that you have on Tropics, but it, it requires, uh, uh, I think, a specific login and credentials to, uh, to take a look. So. It is curious. So, what do you have out there in the data viewer? Uh, will that be open to public soon? Uh, so, I, I think it will, yeah, it will be. So, th those are all uh, you know works in progress. So, we're, okay. we're we're working very hard to generate all kinds of tools. They are they're really fantastic. So, if you know you know for a specific storm, you can go in there and click, and and sh you know show all the tropics data that are relevant to that storm and see the storm track. It's really great. So I think we're working to try to open that up to the general public. We're not there quite yet, but we hope to have it all ready in time for the mission. Right. Right. So that's a really nice tool. And also when the when the uh, the NASA Goddard, they, they call it the, the GES disk, they will also have um, some nice data visualization tools um, for searching and plotting and, and doing things like that as well. So a lot of that is coming. I'm, I'm glad you're, you're already finding those on your own. That's great. Good yeah. for you. Definitely, yeah. We, we look forward to data in general at this point. Data is a new oil, right? Um, so the other question I had is, so um, so I guess you're, you're going to be deploying some of these satellites now, right? And uh, it'll, it'll uh, create massive data as time goes along. So um, is the idea that uh, your team would get into uh, more of machine learning, deep learning, sort of uh, um, uh, methodology to uh, you know, harness more information from this kind of data? Yeah, absolutely. That, that's, that's definitely right. What, what, certainly one, one of the active threads uh, is you know, generally how, you know, given these large, ever-growing data sets, you know, mm -hmm. how, how do you keep up and you know, mine interesting data? So we, we have, we have a, a number of tracks on, on AI and machine learning to try to help us do that. Right. right. And the, uh, I guess the other interesting thing that's happening is trying to put some of these machine learning, move, moving those algorithms closer to the sensor, even having, having them run on the sensor and informing what the sensor does for, for you know, the next generation, right? Those kinds of things are very interesting. Right. So that's interesting. So that, that's something like uh, you, you're looking at uh, edge computing, uh, that sort of uh, framework, uh, like I, I guess, uh, I mean, not to overuse the word cloud because you're working on precipitation data, but right. uh, most of your computations must be on the cloud right now, right? Uh, yeah, that's right. And uh, the idea would be that you move to edge computing and that that, that would be what uh, would mean by, you know, uh, doing all the computations on the sensor. So you'll have interesting, um, uh, interesting uh, analysis of data. Somebody is asked, right. uh, Lakshya Nahar. Uh, yeah, so um, we don't have a feedback form right now, but um, uh, you could write to us here um, at uh, our email ID. We'll be happy to um, give the feedback to the speaker, um, to Bill. Uh, so uh, please feel free to write uh, to us. Yeah. Unfortunately, we don't have a feedback form here, but we didn't think through that. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Sagar, you would like to ask some questions? Yeah, so Jaya has asked quite relevant questions, Bill. And because Jaya being an aerospace engineer and uh, she actually graduated from one of the US universities, University of California Davis. Her background is in uh, bachelor's in engineering in aerospace engineering. And she asked all relevant questions, but 
I have some curiosity. Like, uh, will this constellation mission would also track the clouds, if the interesting clouds, to get some tomographic data? Like uh, you mentioned about precipitation and cloud ice particles, and uh, so if you take like a slice in a in a in a vertical uh, manner, like uh, like slicing a bread, and we can see all those things on the side of uh, the bread slice, right? So, will it also provide uh, you know aerosol uh, conditions and aerosol uh, characteristics? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So, um, th th there's potential for that. So, I, I think to to be most effective with things like you know tracking clouds and and even you know tracking things like water vapor, we need a little bit better spatial resolution than what Tropics has now. So, I, I think for for those kinds of applications, we need. Uh, resolution, you know, five kilometers or better, you know, low single digit kilometer resolution to try to track those features. But that, that's coming. And that's relevant yeah. to the question that we were talking about earlier about deployable apertures and, and you know, making the antennas bigger. So that helps the resolution of the channels that you need to, to do those kinds of, of applications. Uh, so that's one thing that's enabling that is better resolution. That's coming. The other thing is, is uh, things like fully polar metric measurements. Uh, that's also coming. So I think that those will, will you know, lower frequencies with better resolution, fully polar metric. Um, those are the kinds of tools that you need to, to, to make the measurements that you're talking about, kind of vertically, dynamically resolvable uh, processes. Yeah, so I vaguely remember there used to be a satellite called CloudSat. Yeah. So, which was, uh, I think, which was designed and developed by Colorado University, I believe. And they used to have that, you know, the cloud tomographic studies they used to carry out. But that is not small right. satellite. I believe that's a big satellite and which you- That's a big one. That's a, that's a, 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 a W-band radar. Yeah, double band radar, okay. Okay, so very interesting. Actually, I have followed your IEEE TV talk uh, that you have given in, I think, March or April uh, this year. And there I have not seen these Pathfinder images. These Pathfinder images are very interesting that you have shown at the end. So yeah, yeah, we have you know, interest we're, we're, we're very thrilled with those. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah very interesting. So no, thank <laughs> you. Excellent. <laughs> Bill. Thanks. Nice to hear you. I think any other questions? I think there are some questions. Jaya, you can probably say. No, I think we are done with all the questions. So, um, okay. and uh, thank you, Bill, for uh, scrambling to uh, the talk, if, despite the the confusion with the daylight savings thing. I think it's like taken everybody, um, you know, uh, off the, um, I, I, it's just out of the ordinary now, right? Uh, when the yeah, daylight. that's right. It just happened. So we're, we're all, you know, kind of taken aback. <laughs> uh, but it's very unfortunate. And Bill, you remember and last year when Jay contacted you, we were all expecting that you would be here in Bangalore to give an in-person in talk. But somehow I, it has still not happened. And... Uh, so let us hope that uh, the bill will be here at least uh, in the next six months or nine months. It would be I great would to have to, you here. Yeah. I would love to be there. <laughs> so I'll uh, invite uh, Dr. Shyamlal, who is the vice chair of uh, the Atrophy GRS's Bangalore chapter, to give the word of thanks. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Jaya. First of all, I would like to thank Professor William uh, J. Blackbell for uh, delivering uh, IEEE uh, GRSS uh, DL talk on overview of NASA uh, topics CubeSat cancellation mission. Uh, thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivering talk. Thank you so much for your valuable time. I also thank uh, Professor uh, B. S. Dayasagar and Professor Saroj, sir, as a advisor of IEEE uh, GRSS Bangalore section for uh, uh, time to time giving the your support to the current SLAT uh, member. And uh, I also thank uh, all SLAT member of IEEE GRSS Bangalore uh, and uh, Professor Mosmi IEEE uh, GRSS Hyderabad section for uh, joining uh, for joining hand for hosting uh, IEEE uh, GRSS uh, DL talk. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Mosmi. And uh, uh, last, I would like to thank uh, all the participants who attended the today uh, DL talk. Thank you all uh, for attending uh, this event. Over to Jaya.
Yeah, so thanks, uh, Shamlan. So again, Bill, we look forward to having you in person in India, uh, in Bangalore. And uh, we'll be again very happy to host you. Um, and Masmi is here, so uh, Hyderabad is also a great place to visit. So uh, we'll be happy to have you here at any point in time. Yeah. And that would be great. I look forward to that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. And have a great weekend. Bye.